Hi, I'm Rich Folley. We're at Miami Book Fair International. And this is the set of Book View Now. And I am sitting right here with Martha Hodes, the author of Morning Lincoln, which is a new book in the canon of Lincoln literature that's out there. There is a really vibrant community of Lincoln historians. But this is a really unique take on the Lincoln story. It's about the mourning period after Lincoln's mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. First of all, welcome. Great to Thank have you. Thank you. Great to yeah. be here. And it's also, by the way, a, a nominated for the National Book Award this year. You're on the long list. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. That must be nice. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about a little bit. Lincoln, when, when people think about the death of Lincoln, we often are, uh, you know, we often read about a national mourning period mm -hmm. where the country was weeping. You see lots of photos and stories. Not so much. There was a lot of different reactions to the death of Lincoln. Why don't we start there? Great place to start. Um, we do think of the assassination of Lincoln as provoking a nation in mourning. And part of what I tried to do in the book was to uh, complicate that picture. So of course, many of Lincoln's allies were deeply in shock and in grief. And I do spend quite a bit of time on that in the book. But that was not as universal as those mourners themselves imagined. And what's so interesting is that the mourners themselves write in their diaries and letters that the whole world is in mourning and the whole world is in shock. But they know that that's not true because on the same pages in the same diary entries or letters, they will also write about neighbors who are celebrating Lincoln's assassination. And so, of course, the most obvious celebrants were the defeated Confederates. They were not unhappy that Lincoln had been assassinated in some ways, although in other ways they were. And then the other thing that people often don't realize is that there were white Northerners who were celebrating Lincoln's assassination because they were political enemies of his. They were the Northern Democrats who didn't vote for him and who didn't support a war against slavery. Yeah. You, you also write that even the Confederates, there was a split within the, on the Confederate side that some people, while they were simultaneously celebrating, right. they were also at the same time claiming Lincoln as a friend to the Old South in some ways. Exactly. And that's what's so fascinating about the Confederate side, which was so interesting to read all these diaries and letters, because Confederates' first reaction is often a kind of glee. And they really do write in their diaries. They, they cheer. They clap. They'll say things like, hurrah, old Abe Lincoln has been assassinated. But what's so fascinating is white Southerners do also claim Lincoln as what they call their best friend. And it's because they think of him as someone who's moderate and politically lenient, who will treat them well um, after the war is over. And his successor, Vice President Andrew Johnson, Confederates believe that Johnson will be more harsh toward the slaveholders because Johnson didn't like the upper class whites. But what they didn't realize is that um, President Andrew Johnson hated African Americans quite a bit more than he hated elite white Southerners. And so he ended up enacting policies that worked to the benefit of the slaveholders. But people didn't know that. And so they were terrified that Lincoln the moderate was not going to be uniting the country. Yeah. And of course, there's an assumption that African Americans or that black Americans at the time were in deep mourning about mm -hmm. Lincoln's assassination. Mm -hmm. What was the response there? Right. Well, in fact, they were. What's so fascinating is that African Americans had been critical of Lincoln all through the war. They had criticized his hesitance over emancipation. They had wanted him to be more radical, of course. Um, and Lincoln did listen to African Americans, and he did become more attuned to freedom and equality as the war went on. But when, or I should say by the time Lincoln was assassinated, African Americans did think of him as a friend and did think of him as someone who had their interests, their political interests in mind. But the other thing that was so interesting to me was that African Americans also knew that invoking Lincoln after his assassination, calling him a radical, holding him up as a radical, was a political strategy that would help them with what needed to be done after right. the war was over. And so they both had criticized him during the war and then held him up as a model of radicalism for their own purposes. What was the physical act of mourning like at the mm. time? Today we all are so yeah. used to information spreading immediately. Right. What was the, the sort of spread of the news and the sort of reaction to the mourning yeah. like actually the physical response? That's such a great question, especially in the age of social media, although sometimes I have to think back and remember that even as, as recently as 9-11, we didn't have smartphones. Right. It's amazing to think of that. Um, so word came by telegram. And it spread remarkably quickly. So Lincoln died at 7 AM on the morning of April 15th, a Saturday morning. Within hours, people all over the country knew. Um, now, 
you only knew if the telegraph reached where you lived. But the telegraph lines were also followed by the journalists. And so then the newspapers were publishing headlines, and that was being, then the newspapers were being delivered that morning. And then, this is what I found so amazing in contrast to what we would do now, which is turn to our phones and our tablets. As soon as people heard the news, if, say, a servant had picked up the newspaper on the stoop of a well-to-do household and announced the news to them, saw the headline, people went out on the street to look into one another's faces and eyes. It was their equivalent of turning on the TV or the radio or right. checking your phone to see that it was real. Right. And if you saw these other faces with tears or pale or shock, then you knew it had really happened. And everyone wrote about that in their diaries and letters. I went outside. I looked into someone's face, or I opened the door and I looked into my neighbor's eyes. That was how you verified it in the 19th century. Yeah, so clearly you found a lot of diaries, a lot of letters. Yeah. Where did, is that where all your research came from? Mm -hmm. And how do you find, right. that, I mean, to yeah. get the variety of source information that you need from the variety of different groups mm -hmm. represented here? Well, the first thing is it took a long time. So I researched the book for about five years. The thing that made it easier in a way is that anyone who wrote anything personal in the spring and summer of 1865, especially right around mid-April when Lincoln was assassinated, had something to say about the assassination. Sometimes a line, sometimes a six-page letter. Right. So I would go around to archives and I would look for uh, collections of family papers. And I would find collections of family papers that had that time period, the spring and summer of 65. And then I would read. And sometimes I would find a lot and sometimes I would find a little. And the hard part, maybe the hardest part was trying to differentiate when people wrote down their own feelings or when they just copied down the newspaper headlines. So I also had to read the newspaper headlines and the newspaper reports just to see if people were really saying what they felt or maybe saying what they had heard in church. So I had to read the sermons, Easter Sunday sermons, which was the day after Lincoln's death. Um, how much were they just saying what a minister or a journalist had said? What I was looking for was what they were feeling, what individual people were feeling. And there really was quite a bit of that. And I could have researched the book for much, much longer than I did. But I felt by the time I finished researching that each new source I saw was not telling me something I hadn't seen already. Yeah, and it, what, of all that research you saw, yeah. when you know you've got something really special, mm, I mean, exactly. uh, what does that feel like, first of all, as a historian? Mm. And then secondly, can you tell me some of the times that really you were just surprised by some of the things sure. that you found in those diaries? So um, lots of people are saying the same kinds of things, but what you want to find as a writer is the person who says it the best, so that's the example you can use. Right. So that it represents what maybe thousands of people were feeling, but somebody whose words are beautiful or whose words are meaningful. And those kinds of discoveries were always so wonderful. Um, and that was, la what was the second part of your question? The second question was, was there anything that surprised oh, yes. you as you well, were researching this? You know, look, I'm a Civil War historian, so I knew that Confederates despised Lincoln, but I still was surprised by the degree of glee and wrath that they expressed. And I think what was so interesting to me was the way defeated Confederates um, would write in their personal writings that the war isn't over. I mean, they would write words like, the South will rise again, and we will seek our independence at our next opportunity. So they felt like this was a pathway to that. Yes, in many ways. I mean, they knew that they had lost the war. And there was it was actually very interesting to read about um, the depression that many of them felt. Um, they had lost their world. Of course, it was a world of slavery and enslavement. And so that was what they were mourning. Um, but I was just interested, so interested, to see um, how deeply they held on to this cause. And of course, that translated into the post-Reconstruction era of lynching and Jim Crow segregation. Um, I was also, it was very important to me to find African-American voices, very central to the book's narrative. And of course, there are fewer sources, fewer diaries and letters. And so when I came across those sources, they were very, very precious to me. Um, and I also, I used different kinds of sources to find African-American voices, including um, letters that black soldiers wrote to black newspapers. So they weren't quite private and personal, but it was as close as I could get to their voices. And that was very meaningful and very central to the book's narrative. In our last minute, yeah. um, you mentioned the historians, you're a Civil War historian. There is a very distinct group out there that, that studies Lincoln and mm -hmm. they gather together. And you found a very unique sliver of mm -hmm. the conversation for Lincoln. How was it that this one, the mourning element, attracted you? What was it about yeah. this part of Lincoln's legacy? Well, I wanted to tell a story that hadn't yet been told. And I never thought that I would write a book about Lincoln. But really, because of just where we started this interview, this idea that the nation was in mourning was not true 
The moment of the assassination was a moment of intense strife and contention, just when the nation was being remade, of irreconcilable visions that resonate to the present day. And that's the story I wanted to tell in Morning Lincoln. Well, you did it very well. Thank you. I'm not the only one. The National Book Foundation also believes so and honored it with a National Book Award honor. The book is Morning Lincoln. Martha Hodes, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Great book.